Nature offers us many resources, but we don't always use them optimally. Sun and the wind are abundant. So how can we harness them cleverly? Welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa, the environment magazine here in Kampala, Uganda. I am Sandra Twinovudio. And a warm welcome from me, Chris Alems, in Ogun State, Nigeria. Sometimes we can learn from the past. Our ancestors knew pretty well how to farm sustainably. But first, let's look forward. This is what's coming up in the next 30 minutes. How you can charge your cell phone on your own sweater. How green is solar energy really? And farmers returning to an ancient method to feed their cattle. It happened to all of us. You're sitting with your family having dinner and all of a sudden, the lights go out. Power failure. Here in Nigeria, it's unfortunately a daily occurrence for a lot of people. Only about 56% of Nigerians are connected to the national power grid and it's unreliable. On average, a Nigerian home gets about five hours of electricity per day. But because of our proximity to the equator, we have intense energy coming from the sun. How we can harness it effectively, independent of the national power grid, is the focus of this next report from Bamu Bamu in Ogun State. This welding torch is running on electricity while at the same time, mobile phones are charging and the hairdresser next door is running a fan. A few years ago, this would have been impossible for the people in Bamu Bamu, in the state of Ogun. The village wasn't connected to any power grids. Now, it has its own small solar power plant. It's a 85 kilowatt peak plant that is serving not only these 2,500 households, but also people, but also we have above 100 productive users, about 30 commercial users, and also 30 public users. Renewable energy has made the entire village independent of the public grid. Bamu Bamu is one of around 100 communities benefiting from the Nigerian Energy Support Programme. The project receives financial support from Germany and the EU. Local companies build and operate the plants. The, the Nigerian Energy Support Programme commissioned by the European Union and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development has helped the Nigerian people in many ways. We've supported majorly the renewable energy, energy efficiency and rural education measures of the country. Um, we've given 30,000 people access to electricity. In this part of Nigeria, solar energy has proved that it can boost a local economy. Grocers can refrigerate their goods and sell them over a longer period. Tradespeople can work more reliably as they are no longer dependent on gas-powered generators. And Max, a transport company from Lagos, has also set up shop here. It's developed an e-bike that's able to handle conditions on Nigeria's rural roads. Its rental station is located right next to the solar power plant. These people don't have road networks and access to fuel stations, so um, setting up the charging infrastructure for these vehicles right in the heart of the community already saves them time and the amount of uh, uh, the distance that they will have to cover to get power for their, their vehicles. That has you know, tremendous impact on time saving, that has tremendous impact on even security. Many villagers are still skeptical of the new technology. That's why Max stresses the environmental friendliness when marketing his bikes. The fundamental difference is the absence of combustion engines that pollute the, the environment. Max spent you know, a quality time with the members of this community, training them on how to use this, these vehicles, um, on how to get used to um, how quiet they are. 
Farmer Adeniji Dauda is a fan of the bikes and now uses them for deliveries. The rising cost of gas was another factor in his decision to switch to an e-bike, which costs him between 500 and 1,000 naira per day, roughly 1 to 2 euros. Solar power has brought prosperity to our community. People can now use lights, televisions and freezers. And we now have welders who can use solar power to do their work, so we don't have to travel far for such work. Bamu Bamu may be a success story, but it can't disguise the fact that Nigeria has a serious energy problem. Often, only a fraction of its existing capacity is being used due to technical problems and acts of sabotage. The result? 55% of the population has no access to electricity. The electricity problem in Nigeria keeps on rising. There are places that they have not had access to the national grid for more than 20 years, 30 years. We are highly dependent on fossil fuel generator in Nigeria, which costs a lot of money. So renewable energy is the solution to our problem in Nigeria. Renewable energy done in the right way. Damilola Acheleye trains specialists in solar technology. More than 5,000 Nigerians have taken courses at Ashdam Academy. As part of the Nigerian Energy Support Program, they are free of charge. And Ashaleye says her graduates have good job prospects. We need more persons out there that are skilled enough to solve our energy poverty. The participants, they've learned about the different types of components in Nigeria. They've learned about how shaded affects solar resources how to do basic solar installation, how to, how to do maintenance and troubleshooting of solar systems. Graduates from the academy do the maintenance on Bamu Bamu solar power plant, helping make the village a role model for renewable energy in Nigeria. By next year, the government plans to supply a further 100,000 people with electricity from clean energy sources. More solar power plants would certainly help a lot of people here in Nigeria. And they don't always have to be huge. Solar energy can also be very useful on a small scale. One student from Kenya came up with an ingenious idea for how to recharge devices such as cell phones, doing entirely without power banks or electricity from the grid. Let's find out more in this week's Doing Your Bits. and I'm a very much aware about uh, being electrocuted. So I must make my things with the uh, insulators. So they are insulated and they're waterproof. They cannot uh, electrocute anybody. Another thing, uh, it's safe because uh, it's um, solar powered. seen anyone else with something like this you see so uh, it gives me that I mean it's like I'm living in 2030 yeah? <laughs> Kaflot sells his hoodies for the equivalent of 49 euros he is hoping he will soon be able to expand his business beyond Nairobi and how about you if you're also doing your bit tell us about it Visit our website or send us a tweet.
hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. What a fantastic idea. I'd love a hoodie like that. It's a small scale example of a technology that has been adopted worldwide in huge solar farms, which supply energy to entire regions. That is very true, Chris. Of course, the solar panels have to be produced fast, and that requires some toxic materials like lead. And what about the old panels? Can they be recycled? How green is solar energy, really? Our reporter took a look and found out. It's emissions free. That's why solar energy is said to be so green. But is that really true? Let's have a closer look at the three critical issues surrounding solar energy. First, let's look at what impact solar energy has on the climate. Solar panels produce electricity without creating emissions, but producing them uses lots of energy. Raw materials have to be mined, transported, processed. Then the whole thing has to be assembled. And as our economies still largely run on fossil fuel, all this means greenhouse gas emissions. So the question is, how much? And how much is that compared to other sources of energy? An evaluation revealed the following results. On average, solar energy emits around 40 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour it produces, which is really low compared to fossil fuels like natural gas at 500 grams or coal at 1,000. In future, there might even be completely new solar technologies like perovskite modules. These promise to use less energy in production and convert even more sunlight into electricity. That would create a kind of snowball effect. The more solar gets deployed, the cleaner it will become to produce even more. So, strictly speaking, solar energy isn't completely emissions-free, but it is already one of the climate-friendliest energy sources we have. Next up, let's take a look at what actually goes into making all these panels. To produce solar cells, you need quite a few chemical substances, like silicon tetrachloride, for example. If it ends up in the water, it can have devastating effects on the environment and people's health. It can be recycled and then reused, but it's unclear how many manufacturers do that. We have a lot of hazardous chemicals of concern that are in, used in, um, to make solar panels. The coalition developed the Solar Scorecard that ranks manufacturers by their sustainability. That's uh, pretty much uh, the problem with solar. So it is green, but it's only green in one phase. We want to make sure it's green throughout its life cycle. Finally, let's take a look at where all these panels go to die. Solar panels last around 30 years. As of now, the waste heap of discarded panels is still relatively low, about 250,000 metric tons. But by 2050, it's expected to grow to 78 million metric tons. That would be more than 200 Empire State buildings of old solar panels. Well, you know, now it's a, we can see that it's going to be a problem, but of course in, in the next 10 years or 15 years is going to be a major crisis where old panels would pile onto the mountains of e-waste we're already struggling to deal with. But there is a solution, recycling the panels. Governments in the European Union, for example, made it compulsory for manufacturers to make sure their used panels get recycled. But still, not all of the materials can be used to make new solar panels. And... The cost of recycling is relatively high, and that's partially at least because there's not yet that many modules to recycle. This means in places without legislation, like the USA or China, it's still cheaper to throw old modules into landfills. A French startup came up with a new recycling process, focusing on recovering the most valuable materials. Actually, the economic return of the glass is not that high. So uh, we try to integrate also how much value that has to be recycled. So silicon and silver uh, together, it's about 3% of the total weight only. 
it has 70, more, even more than 70 percent of the uh, of the economic value. The company hopes to make a profit recovering the materials and then be able to build more solar panels. So for now, solar power is not entirely green, but the good news is that solar panels can be recycled and that it's actually worth it. Protecting our environment means we have to keep improving the technologies we use. And one man in the Netherlands is doing exactly that. Agriculture and forestry are responsible for almost a quarter of global carbon dioxide emissions. But by making greenhouses more green, this entrepreneur is aiming to make them more climate friendly, even climate neutral. These are the greenhouses of Peter Weinen, and for years, his obsession has been to run them as environmentally friendly as possible. He specializes in sweet peppers and cucumbers and produces huge amounts of these vegetables. Yeah, in total, uh, our company is, is 50 hectares. Uh, on the 50 hectares, we grow 32 hectares uh, sweet peppers. Uh, what we have as well is, is long English cucumbers, what you can see here. Uh, we grow them about 30 million pieces a year. It's a complex and finely tuned operation in all aspects of growing, feeding and harvesting the produce. And behind it is an elaborate system of energy production using as little energy from the grid as possible. Like this is the transport system, but this is also the heating system. This, this is a pipe. Um, we put in, for example, 55 degrees of water. The hot water from the biomass plant, for example, or the CHP, uh, the combined heat and power, uh, can go into the greenhouse. And during the night, the roof is shielded by retractable blinds to keep in the heat, which again saves energy. This is a 20-cylinder, uh, 3 megawatt electricity uh, engine, which is provided by the yellow tube is gas and then the machine is running making three megawatt electricity and producing to cool it down 3.3 uh, megawatt thermic and that's the energy how we used to heat our greenhouses his real pride and joy is his biomass plant which recycles local green waste including the stalks of his own vegetables it's mainly chips from the area and like this truck is also coming from the area. Um, yeah, it's collected. Uh, it's only the rest product. So how does it work? Yeah, the biomass comes from up, falls down on the grate, and then afterwards everything is cleaned. Uh, and on top, uh, with the heat, we make steam. With steam, we make electricity. To build this big system of energy generation, Peter invested 30 million euros, a sum only larger companies can afford. We'll remain in Europe for the time being, but switch from the high to low tech. In France, severe heat waves and ongoing drought are destroying crops and the land used for grazing. To feed his cattle, one farmer has revived an age-old tradition used by his grandfather which, as it turns out, is surprisingly effective. 2022 was the hottest summer ever recorded in Europe. Many regions had little rain for months. Rivers, streams and lakes dried up. Even major waterways like the Loire River in France were reduced to a trickle. French farmers were hit particularly hard by the drought. Crops shriveled on the fields and pastures baked in the sun, leaving cattle with little food to eat. In desperation, farmers turned to a nearly forgotten source of food, the leaves and branches of trees. Ash trees, they're like insurance against drought. They've been here since before my grandfather bought the land in 1939. Most of them were planted here since they grow quite well. Coppicing is a farming method that has existed in Europe for thousands of years. Trees are cut back on a regular cycle and the stems and branches are used as cattle feed. For decades, there was plenty of rain and grazing land here, so coppicing fell into disuse. Now, recurring drought is reviving the tradition. This year, which was dry, I don't know how many we pruned. We pruned a lot of them, several hundred. An ash tree like the one we've just cut back will feed about six to eight cows. 
There were days this summer where we had to coppice several trees, sometimes up to ten. The trees are a big money saver for farmer Christian Bonal. He estimates it saved him from having to order two truckloads of hay this year. Without the ash trees, he would have spent about 7,000 euros on hay. Here we pruned an ash tree to make fodder. We made a bundle out of it which we're going to dry. We'll give it to the calves when they're a month, a month and a half old. They like the crunchy leaves in the spring. These ash trees were planted for coppicing long ago. Today, Christian Bonal is bringing these branches into storage to feed his cattle in the winter and in times of drought. He's benefiting from the wisdom of generations of farmers who knew that, as the saying goes, only a full cow is a happy cow. Now, we head back to Africa, where we also have a long tradition of knowledge that we can use to help in the fight against climate change. In Zimbabwe, performer Zenzo Nyasi is bringing these ideas to the stage. That's right, Sandra. In his one-man show, Inyathi investigates the role traditional knowledge systems and science play in a fast-changing world and in climate change intervention. Take a look. I am sick today. Man has made me sick. Actor Zenzo Niathi gives the suffering earth a voice. He also plays a farmer who leads an ox and a plow across tough soil. The actor uses comedy and drama to teach children about climate change and environmental protection. The story, An Act of Man, is about the life of a rainmaker who's lost his powers. The work was specifically conceived with children in mind. How can humans survive famines and droughts? To answer that question, the actor also plays the role of a scientist. Climate is changing. We should at least change our farming ways. Switch from maize and uh, start doing your, your sorghum, your millet. These small grains that are good for our climatic environment. The kids seem to be getting the message, especially the part about humans needing to act quickly. I learned that, uh, I learned about climate and weather, and I learned also how to also enjoy myself. I must plant trees and tell everybody to plant trees. For the teachers, the show is a welcome addition to the lessons in which they emphasize the importance of environmental protection. It is important to incorporate that into our um, arts aspect and doing a performing arts performance because they understand it more. So it's out of the formal education in class. The tour started in two smaller cities. Now Zenzo Niafi is performing in the capital Harare. The actor developed the show in just seven weeks. He's been involved with climate protection for a while now. For his second job as a farmer, he uses climate-friendly farming methods on his own land. Traditional knowledge systems played a role in the past years, and that science is playing a role now. But how best can we merge these two, especially concerning issues of climate change? To keep adults entertained, the topic is presented with a touch of humor. But it quickly gets serious. And then one day, there was an announcement on radio of rains coming from the east. In fact, I was so happy. The rains that we have been praying for are the same grains that have taken your sister and your brother. The show's creators hope that the performance serves as an example to others. What we really would like to see is to, to excite other people, particularly young actors, where they can actually say, I, I want to do the same so that it, it continues being done 
over and over again by quite a number of people. We are happy that we have poked people that have the know-how and we are hoping that by poking them, instead of them doing a lot of discussions, there will be more action around issues of climate change. His own contribution is this show. If he's able to acquire financial backing, he'll perform it in all of Zimbabwe's 11 provinces. There are so many eco-friendly solutions and initiatives out there. We hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Chris Alems from Ogun State, Nigeria. Tune in again next week. And if you want to find out more, don't forget to check us out on our social media platforms. We'll be back with another new edition of Eco Africa next week. It is a goodbye from me, Sandra Twinovidio, here in Kampala, Uganda.